The next, uh, next session will be uh, Dr. Uh, Saha Sa and Dr. Uh, Gregory uh, Seltzer um, from uh, Danville, uh, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, discussing outcomes of aortic bifemoral bypass based on configuration of the proximal mastomosis. Good evening, and thank you for the opportunity to present our work. My name is Sahad Shah, and I'm a second-year medical student at Geisinger Commonwealth School of Medicine. We do not have any conflicts of interest to disclose. To begin, aortobifemoral bypass remains an important treatment modality in the revascularization of aortoiliac occlusive disease. Patency at the end of 10 years is reported to be excellent, upwards of 75 to 80%. Historically, the end-to-site configuration was preferred in the setting of bilateral external iliac artery occlusion with a patent common iliac artery. However, in the modern era, primary stenting of the iliac arteries has been the treatment of choice. But despite ABF being performed for decades, there's limited data comparing the end-to-end -end or end-to-side proximal aortic anastomosis. Previous studies have reported higher patency rates for the end-to-end -end anastomosis due to the theoretical advantage of less turbulence at the site of anastomosis. Yet others have shown comparable short and long-term results between the two configurations. However, these studies were largely limited to small single center cohorts of fewer than 100 patients. As a result, questions remain regarding the preferred arrangement of the proximal anastomosis, in particular, its effect on the graft patency. The aim of the study was to compare the patency and periprocedural outcomes of ABF based on end-to-end -end or end-to-side proximal anastomosis configuration. This is a retrospective multicenter study using the VQI database. We analyzed all ABF cases from 2009 to 2020 and grouped them based on proximal anastomosis configuration. 22 cases were excluded due to missing data, leaving us with approximately 48% cases end to side and 52% cases end to end. So our two groups of comparison for the study are the end to side and end to end proximal configuration. We first performed a univariate comparison of baseline and perioperative characteristics using the student's t-test for continuous variable and chi-square for categorical variable. This was then followed up with a multivariate logistic regression to compare perioperative and one-year outcomes between the two cohorts. The primary outcome of our study was graph patency and major amputation rates at one year, and our secondary outcomes include perioperative characteristics, return to OR, and graft infection. Looking at patient characteristics, we found that the end-to-end -end and end-to-side cohorts were comparable in terms of age, gender, BMI, and history of smoking. The end-to-side cohort had a significantly greater number of patients with a history of arterial bypass. We also looked at the indication for ABF, particularly claudication, rest pain, tissue loss, acute ischemia, and found that the two cohorts were comparable. Looking at the post-operative characteristics, we found that the end-to-side cohort had a statistically higher frequency of extubation in the operating room, with approximately 80% of the patients being extubated in the OR. The end to side cohort also had a statistically lower change in renal function and use of vasopressors. However, the end to side cohort had significantly higher rates of return to OR, with 10.2% compared to 8.7% in the end to end cohort. No significant difference was found in graft infection, graft thrombosis, or wound complication. Looking at one year follow up, we found that the end to side cohort had a significantly lower primary graft patency rate and higher rates of graft occlusion and graft revision. The end to side cohort also had higher rates of claudication and rest pain symptoms compared to the end to end cohort. There was no significant difference in the rates of infection between the two cohorts. Looking at multivariate analysis, we observed that the end-to-side configuration was significantly associated with a lower frequency of graft patency at the end of one year. This cohort also had a greater rate of return to OR for revision and recurrence of symptoms compared to the end-to-end -end cohort. And this was consistent with our univariate analysis. There are several limitations to the study. First, the data set was limited to one year, making it difficult to compare long-term outcomes between the two configurations especially the rates of infection. Second, there is considerable selection bias for the type of anastomosis being performed depending on the severity of the arterial disease, and that was inherent in the study design. 
Lastly, data was unavailable for a proximal clamp location, which could have a significant effect on the post-operative renal function. In conclusion, while the end to site cohort seemed to have less physiologic insult immediately post-op with lower change in renal function, use of vasopressors, and higher rates of extubation in OR, the end-to-end -end configuration appeared to have improved one-year outcomes with higher rates of graft patency and lower rate of return to OR for revision. To our knowledge, this study is one of the largest population-based study comparing the outcomes of the two anastomotic configurations in the endovascular era. Finally, long-term follow-up is needed to determine which configuration is optimal. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to answering any questions. Maybe I'll start off. Um, was it, were you able to uh, exclude or find out were there any of these done for any, like a mix of aneurysmal as well as atherosclerotic disease? Because uh, the end and anastomosis would be uh, partly with the aneurysmal disease as well. Right. Um, I think in our cohort, we most of them are aneurysmal compared to atherosclerotic, but if we did not, um, like, do we need to difference between the two? Yeah. So these actually, sorry, I'm Greg Sells from Guys Good. Um, oh, yeah. We actually, these are mostly, these are almost all, we excluded aneurysmal disease in this cohort. Okay. So. Yeah. Thank you. Mark Hunter from Boston. Do you have any uh, data on the runoff and where the distal anastomoses were? Because it seems like your outcomes should be all driven by your distal anastomosis and your runoff, at least in my experience, and not the proximal. And I think that also having post-op need for pressors isn't necessarily a, uh, a good surrogate for a difficult operation because if you're really doing aortal bifems for people with near occlusions of their aortas, when you add the legs again, sometimes it takes a couple days for the heart to catch up. And so I've had patients reading the paper on pressors for a couple of days while their whole body gets better. So I think that this is a really good attempt to answer a question, but I think you're missing the points that actually kind of drive your outcomes. Do you have any ability to look at those? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, in terms of the distal anastomosis, so we did look at a variety of different um, sites and we found no significant difference between the two cohorts. But um, in this study, we primarily just used the irritable bifemoral bypass. So we just looked at that cohort. Sorry, just to add, we don't have information on outflow. Um, it's, you know, it's a big limitation, we realize that, so. Yeah. Uh, really nicely presented. Uh, question I have for you is, do you, do you have a, any, any input on whether this was done ret in a retroperitoneal fashion or transperitoneal? Because it does make a difference. I think endocytes lie a lot better from a retroperitoneal approach, you know, as opposed to aneurysmal disease. It, you know, the space is limited in the retroperitoneum and the graft often bulges, that's why we always, make a concerted effort to try to do end-to-end, -end, reimplant IMAs, do things like that. Very unusual circumstances of having bilateral external occlusions that require an end aside. But when we do, we do it from a retroperitoneal approach. Did you have any data on that? To my recollection, like, we didn't have that variable in the VQI database, but that's a good question for sure to consider. Hey there, uh, David Ebert's out of Case Western. A great presentation uh, and interesting. I think some of your outcomes fit really well for like a cost analysis thought process, especially when you're talking about return to OR, length of intubation, but also your recurrence of symptoms. Because if they have to come back for another, another OR, that's another chance for reintubation or return to OR. And it seemed like there was a little bit difference between your two subgroups in those. Obviously, you don't have the data with VQI for cost analysis. You'd have to get that from another um, insurance tract databases. But if you had to guess, do you know? which of your two populations might be less intensive on the financial system? Would it be better in terms of do you think one group overall decreases hospital use? Yeah, no, that's a good question. And I think, you know, that's a good suggestion too with the Cox proportional. Like we definitely looked into it, but we didn't have the data. Um, but I think in, to answer your question, the end-to-end -end cohort, um, you know, our hypothesis is that that would have significantly lower cost, especially in terms of the lower length of stay um, in the hospital. Um, and we also saw like the, um, you know, the differences in the rate of extubation um, in the OR between the two cohorts. Uh, but I think, you know, having more data, um, especially deriving from different databases would be super helpful. Thank, Thank you, you for that. Okay, great, Thank you very much. Thank you.